Any attempt to tell the story of Western philosophy must begin with the ancient Greeks, who produced not only the first, but some of the greatest Western philosophers. The one whose name is probably most familiar is Socrates, who died in the year 399 BC. But there were several outstanding Greek philosophers before him, some of whose names are also widely known. For example, Pythagoras and Heraclitus. There were others, too, of comparable caliber, the first one of all being Thales, who flourished in the 6th century BC. If all these pre-Socratic philosophers can be said to have had one common concern, it was an attempt to find universal principles which would explain the whole of nature. In today's terms, they were as much concerned with what we would call science as with what we would call philosophy. Now, Socrates was in conscious rebellion against their tradition. He maintained that what we most need to learn is not how nature works, but how we ourselves ought to live, and therefore that we need first and foremost to consider moral questions. Socrates didn't write anything. He did all his teaching by word of mouth, and none of the writings of any of the pre-Socratic philosophers have come down to us directly. So all that we know of any of the philosophers whose names I've mentioned so far is what has come down to us second-hand through the writings of others, though this does include some pretty long summaries and a good many direct quotations. The first philosopher who wrote works which we actually now possess complete was Plato. He was a pupil of Socrates, and in fact it's from Plato's writings that most of our knowledge of Socrates derives. In his own right, however, Plato was, beyond any question, one of the greatest philosophers of all time. Some think the greatest. So, if we have to choose an arbitrary starting point in what is, after all, a continuous story, then in many ways a good one is the year 399 BC, with the death of Socrates and then the subsequent writings of Plato. Plato was about 31 when Socrates died and lived to be 81. During that half-century, he founded his famous school in Athens, the Academy, which was the prototype of what we call a university, and he produced his writings, nearly all of which take the form of dialogues, with different arguments being put in the mouths of different characters, one of whom nearly always is Socrates. Most, though not all, of these dialogues are called by the name of one of the people Socrates is talking to in them. Thus, we have the Phaedo, the Lachies, the Euthyphro, the Theaetetus, the Parmenides, the Timaeus, and so on. There are more than two dozen of them, some of them 20, some 80, a couple of them 300 pages long. The most famous of all are probably the Republic and the Symposium, but most of them are easily available nowadays in paperback translations. The best are regarded as works of literature, great works of literature, as well as of philosophy. Plato was an artist as well as a thinker, and many people regard his prose as the finest Greek prose ever to have been written by anyone. With me now is one of the acknowledged experts on Plato in the English-speaking world, the Professor of Ancient Philosophy in the University of Cambridge, Miles Bernier. Professor Bernier, I know that you regard Plato's career as a creative philosopher as having been somehow launched by Socrates' death. How was that? Well, I think Socrates' death in... 399 must have been a traumatic event for a lot of people. Socrates had been this spellbinding presence around in Athens for many, many years, much loved, much hated. He'd been on, caricatured on the comic stage. Then suddenly this familiar figure's not there anymore, and he's not there because, I mean, this is the, must have been the most traumatic thing, he's been condemned to death on a charge of impiety and corrupting the young. Well, he'd had a lot of followers, and some of them, amongst them Plato, began writing Socratic dialogues, conversations, philosophical conversations, in which Socrates takes the lead. It must have been like a chorus of voices saying to the Athenians, look, he's not gone after all, he's still here, still asking those awkward questions, still tripping up with his arguments. And, of course, they were also defending his reputation and showing he'd been unjustly condemned, he was the great educator of the young, not the great corrupter. But the death of Socrates wasn't just, so to speak, a launching pad for Plato, was it? It, 
the whole of Plato's outlook can, in one sense, be explained with reference to Socrates, can it not? I think it can. Um, the, to keep alive the Socratic spirit for Plato meant to go on doing philosophy in the way Socrates had done. To, so what you get is a group of early dialogues in which he is basically showing Socrates discussing the sorts of questions he was interested in, very largely moral questions. But since to do philosophy in the Socratic way means to do it by thinking philosophically, the process bit by bit and inevitably leads Plato to develop his own ideas in a host of other areas so that Socrates, there's a sort of evolution in the picture of Socrates from the gadfly questioner of the early dialogues, he gradually turns into the man who's expounding political theories, metaphysical theories and so on in the middle period dialogues, Mono, Symposium, Phaedo and Republic. And I suppose also one can say that in the early dialogues, Plato is dealing with subjects that interested Socrates and dealing them with, with them in Socrates' way. And he's then carried, so to speak, by his own momentum as the years go by into dealing with subjects that interest him, Plato, and beginning to deal with them in a different way. I think that's right. Uh, wherever he can plausibly present the ideas as the outgrowth of thinking about Socrates' ideas, they get put in the mouth of Socrates. Uh, and I think it's very important to, that what he, the way he presents Socrates, the historical claim he makes about him is, this is a man who thought for himself and taught others to think for themselves. So if you want to be a follower of Socrates, that means thinking for yourself and, if necessary, departing from ideas and areas that Socrates had marked out. Now, those early dialogues where Socrates is dealing with moral questions all have a certain common pattern, don't they? I mean, what happens in nearly all of them is that Socrates is talking to some interlocutor uh, who thinks he knows the meaning of some very familiar term like friendship or courage or piety or something of that kind. And by simply quizzing him, by interrogating him, by submitting him to what's become known as Socratic questioning, Socrates shows this person, and incidentally the onlookers as well, that they don't at all have a clear grasp of this concept that they thought they understood so well. Now, this process has itself been of enormous importance in philosophy ever since, hasn't it? Not only has it been, but these very works are still very widely used to teach philosophy and to introduce philosophy to people who want to uh, know something about it. You start with a familiar and important it's always a concept that's important in our life. And you get people to realize that there are problems in that concept. They try to think about it. They produce an answer. Socrates shows the inadequacy of the answer. You end up not with a firm answer, but with a much better grasp of the problem than you had before. And you, the reader, 20th century reader or an ancient reader, are left both drawn into the problem and wanting to get the answer and feeling that perhaps you can contribute. I can't answer. help reflecting that even after more than 2,000 years, we're still puzzling about the meaning of terms like beauty or courage or friendship. We're still wondering precisely what these things consist of. Have we got any further after all this time? Yes and no must be the answer, mustn't it? Um, I think Plato would very be very firmly insistent that even if we, he did know the answer if he told us it wouldn't do us any good i mean it's the nature of these questions that they are ones that you have to think about for yourself and an answer is worth nothing unless it's come through your own thinking and that's why these dialogues are so successful as instruments for drawing you into philosophy in those early dialogues that we're still for the moment confining ourselves to um one thing that Socrates keeps saying is that he has no positive doctrines of his own to teach, that all he's doing is asking people questions. But there seems to be something disingenuous about this claim on Socrates' part. I think that, in fact, there are, so to speak, unacknowledged doctrines lying under the surface of these dialogues. Would you agree with that? Well, there are some doctrines that emerge, not very many, um, there is a group of ideas 
which comes out in the Apology, for instance, when he says that to a good man no harm can come either during his life or after his death, and which comes out in the Gorgias when he argues at great length that injustice harms the doer and justice benefits the doer. It's the idea that there is no real harm that can come to you. You lose your money, stricken by, paralyzed by disease. None of that really counts as harm. Only the loss of your virtue would count it. Only going in for bad practices like injustice, they would be the only real harm, because the only real harm is harm to the soul. There's a group of ideas which he's, Socrates is very emphatic about, where he sometimes even claims to have knowledge, and it's also a group of ideas where Plato never reneges on Socrates. He remains convinced of the truth of the proposition that injustice harms the doer and justice benefits him. And that's provided your soul remains untouched, worldly misfortunes don't do you any harm of any really deep significance. That's right. Yes. There's another group of ideas which Socrates, where Socrates does not claim knowledge and where Plato eventually is going to renege on Socrates, and that's the group of ideas summed up in the statement that virtue is knowledge. In these dialogues, when somebody's asked what's courage, what's friendship, what's justice, sooner or later as the discussion proceeds, the idea emerges that this virtue, courage or piety, should be regarded as a kind of knowledge. And that's just as strong and paradoxical a statement as the first group of ideas, because common sense, and I mean common sense then as now, ordinarily supposes that it's one thing to have the wisdom to know what the best thing to do in a given situation is, but another thing which you also need, the courage to carry it out if it's difficult, or the temperance to resist an easier option instead. Wisdom's one virtue, one quality to admire in a person, courage is another, and a man may have one and not the other, or diff each of them to different degrees. But if courage just is this knowledge, then that kind of contrast can't arise. If I don't do the right thing, it can't be that I knew what I should do, but lacked the courage to carry it out. I just, if I lacked the courage, I lacked the knowledge, and I didn't know what the right thing to do was. So any wrongdoing that I do is done in ignorance because I didn't know it wasn't the best thing to do, and if done in ignorance, done involuntarily. So no one does wrong willingly is the famous way it's yeah. summed up. Doesn't the unvarying dialogue form that uh, Plato writes in give rise to two rather important and also really unnecessary problems? First, to what extent is this the historical Socrates whose views are being put before us? And to what extent is he a kind of fictional character created by Plato? Because after all, all these dialogues were written after Socrates' death. And the other question, perhaps related to that, is what are the author's own views? Because again, since these are all dialogues, it means that all opinions are put into the mouth of other characters. And that sometimes, at least, leaves us feeling that we're not quite sure what Plato himself actually thinks. Well, I think there's a sense in which we need to worry about this question and a sense in which we don't. The sense in which we don't is that Plato's portrait of Socrates makes the claim, here is a man who thought for himself and would overthrow long-cherished conclusions if it turned out that he thought they were wrong. Uh, and he taught others to do the same. So if Plato comes to think that there is more to virtue than knowledge, though knowledge remains the most important factor, and he does come to think this, then it's only in keeping with the Socratic spirit to throw over the doctrine that virtue is knowledge and produce a better view of his own. The other side of the coin is, of course, it's most important that we notice what's happening when Socrates in the Republic says something incompatible with what Socrates said in the Protagoras. Notice that we're getting a new view and how it connects with all the other concerns of the Republic, how it makes a much more complicated picture of moral education and how it makes possible a new vision of a political ideal society.
the important thing is the search and the inquiry, but it's got to be inquiry, search, with understanding of where we've got to from where. Yes, in other words, because our assumptions and beliefs and so on are open to perpetual questioning, conclusions, in quotation marks, don't have any special status. They're, they are themselves staging posts on the road to further inquiry. That's, I think, what Plato believed very strongly. Yes. And, and so he's, in a way, demonstrating this to us by his practice. Exactly. And yeah. I think he would claim that that was what it was to keep the Socratic spirit alive. Yeah. Perpetual question. Mm. It's usual, isn't it, to divide Plato's output into three periods. It happens so often with writers and even creative artists, the early, the middle, and the later. And so far in this discussion, we've been confining ourselves to consideration of the early dialogues. When you move to the middle period Plato dialogues, you find Plato for the first time beginning to put forward positive ideas of his own, not Socrates's, but Plato's own ideas, and to argue for those ideas. Which would you say are the most important of Plato's positive doctrines? I think one has to single out two above all, the theory of forms and the doctrine that learning is recollection, the idea that to learn something is to recover from within your mind recesses uh, knowledge that you had before you were born. Let me take that one first of the two. I think a lot of people will think when they first hear this that uh, we are born knowing things. That might sound a bit bizarre, but at least very closely related ideas to that have been permanent in our Western culture. I mean, idealist philosophers have thought that there was innate knowledge or innate ideas. Most of the religions, I think, believe something of the sort. And we even have eminent contemporary thinkers like Chomsky believing that you're born with a whole grammar programmed into your mind. Now, what was Plato's version of this belief? Plato's version was that this knowledge was part of the essential nature of the soul, which the soul possessed before you were born, because he believes at this period in the soul existing before it's embodied in this world. And I think to understand this theory, um, one's got to go back to those early Socratic discussions. Uh, if you look at one of these early discussions, somebody is asked for a definition of, let's say, courage, and Lakeys, who's the person who's asked that, says at one point, courage is endurance. Socrates then asks him some further questions, and he always does this when he's been given a definition, he says, is courage invariably a fine and admirable quality? Yes, says Lakeys. And then Socrates takes him through a number of examples of endurance, where endurance is not admirable at all, maybe very foolhardy, pig-headedness, or, or yeah. it may just be morally neutral, yes. as when a, some, a financer keeps on spending money, enduring the losses, because he knows he's going to get a profit at the end. So if endurance is morally neutral or bad, courage isn't, courage is always good, then courage can't be endurance. That's a typical pattern of Socratic discussion. Logically, all that's actually happened is Lakey's has been shown that his beliefs are inconsistent. If we take all the answers together, they can't all be right because they contradict each other. But Socrates always presents the situation as one in which that definition, courage is endurance, has been refuted. So that he is, in practice, taking Lakey's secondary answers as either true or somehow nearer the truth than the definition, and hence available as a basis for refuting the definition and saying that's the one that's got to go. Can I just uh, uh, stop you there? Because I think you've said something that's of great importance to us all today. I think we all tend to have this assumption that by discussion you can get at the truth, whereas almost by definition discussion can't necessarily do that. All it can the most it can show you is that your conclusions are consonant with your premises. But of course, if there's something wrong with the premises, then there'll be something wrong with the yeah. conclusion. Well, we are very attached to this idea, and if you think about it, it's actually quite hard to justify. Socrates doesn't try to justify it, he just does this and says we've now refuted the definition. But if one had to give a theory of what he's doing, uh, then one would have to say something like, what I've just said and you've just implied, that we all have within us the means for 
making the truth vanquish the false. And that's exactly what Plato does in the Meno. He produces, as it were, a theory of Socratic or philosophical discussion, which puts forward the suggestion that we all have latent within our minds the correct answers to these questions, what is courage, what is justice, and so on. And it's that knowledge, deep back within, not immediately accessible, that knowledge is what enables us to knock down all the wrong answers and show they're wrong, and that knowledge is gradually emerging bit by bit in the course of that bit of discussion where, for instance, one thing that Lakey's says is used to show that some other thing that Lakey says must be false. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that uh, in your view, the doctrine you've just expounded for us ties up directly with what the basis is for Plato's most famous doctrine of all, the theory of forms. That doctrine must have been the most influential part of his philosophy in the whole history of philosophy. In fact, it's what the word Platonism has historically almost come to mean. Now, can you explain that to us? Well, remember that these discussions which Socrates has are all centered on a definitional question. What is the definition of courage, of beauty, of justice? If now we have latent within ourselves the knowledge of the answers to those questions, and we have that knowledge independently of and prior to our experience of the world we live in, our using our senses and our going around from place to place, we, our knowledge is prior to that, independent of that, then surely what we know, justice, beauty, courage, must itself be independent of and prior to this empirical world we're now existing in. And that thesis is the fundamental assertion of the theory of forms, that justice, beauty, and the like exist independently of and prior to all the just actions, just people, all the beautiful things, statues, objects, any that you can find, um, beauty and justice exist on their own and apart. That's the theory of forms. This theory that there is another world than this, uh, an ideal world, which is not this world, but in which everything exists that actually gives value and meaning to this world, has had incalculable influence on the whole of our culture, hasn't it? Yes. It's had immense influence on Christianity, for example. I don't want to go into that now, because I think we ought to stick to the philosophy, but that's just one example of the enormous influence that it's had. Yes. Yes. And... But I think one should be careful of using phrases like the, the world of forms or another world. Plato uses them, but the contrast he has in mind is not, as one might have thought, a contrast between one set of particular things, and then another one completely like it, except more perfect, more abstract, somewhere else, some heaven somewhere. His contrast is between the particular and the general. Those questions, what is justice, what is beauty, are general questions. They're not questions about the here and now, and that's the contrast. There's a point in the Phaedo where Socrates is saying that to do philosophy is to rehearse for death. It is, in fact, to practice being dead. <laughs> Why? Well, because being dead is having one's soul separate from the body. And not considering the things of this world. And yes. in doing philosophy, you are, so far as you can, separating mm. the soul from the body, because you're not thinking about the here and now. If you're asking what's justice anywhere, anytime, justice in itself, you're not asking who did me wrong now, yesterday. If you're asking what's beauty, you're not asking who is the most beautiful person in this room. And if you're not thinking about the here and now, then, in the sense Plato's interested in, you're not here and now. You are where your mind is, not because you're in some other particular place, but a better one, but because you're not in that in place, in that sense at all. You're immersed in generalities. So it's all right to use the phrase the world of forms subject to the qualification that that means the realm of invariable generalities. Yes, yeah, so the word world here is actually misleading. We yeah. mustn't think of it as a place right. where certain spiritual things subsist. Right. Yes. 
Now, these middle period dialogues that we're talking about now, I'm thinking particularly of the, the Mino, the Fido, the Republic, the Symposium, the Phaedrus. These were written by Plato when he was absolutely at the height of his powers, weren't they? And I think this is actually a good point for us to pause for a moment and think of their literary and aesthetic qualities. Why are these dialogues regarded, and always have been regarded, as supreme works of literary art? Why is that so? They're so alive. I mean, a lot of other philosophers have tried writing dialogues, both ancient and modern, Xenophon, Cicero, Augustine, Barclay and Hume. But the only one of those ones I've just named who comes anywhere near Plato is Hume. And I think this is because for Hume, like Plato, it's the process of philosophical thinking that counts at least as much as the answers. With Xenophon or Barclay, it's all too clear you're reading somebody who cares about the answers, not the process of journeying towards them. Where Plato's concerned, we have to add his fantastic mastery of language, whether it's high-flown imaginative descriptions or witty repartee, jokes, images. He's terribly good at making crystal clear the most difficult thoughts. You can go on adding, I mean, because in the end, it's just that he's an artistic genius as well as a philosophical one. Do you share the uh, traditional view that his masterpiece is the Republic? Yes, I do. Why? I think because it's in the Republic more than anywhere else that he makes good his belief that every question is connected with every other and that the inquiry really can't stop that even a conclusion for now leads on to the next problem. I mean, you, you begin with a straightforward question, what is justice, familiar Socratic kind of question. That becomes the question, is justice a benefit to its possessor? And Socrates sets out, and this is really the task of the whole republic, to show that justice is a benefit to its possessor, indeed the thing you need most of all if you're to be happy, whereas the unjust man is the most miserable of all creatures. But to do that, it turns out, he has to give a theory of human nature. He divides the soul into three parts, and this is where he reneges on Socrates' thesis that virtue is knowledge. Virtue turns out to involve more than knowledge, though knowledge must be in control. And with the idea that knowledge is something that can and should be in control of the non-rational factors, you also get the idea, which that but now becomes possible, of a, of a society in which knowledge was in control. Um, so we get a whole political theory of a new, better way of life in society. All this emphasis on knowledge being in control raises the question, what knowledge, and what is knowledge anyway, and why is it better than an opinion? So you've got a theory of knowledge. The question, what knowledge the philosophers need in order to rule the rest of us, becomes an inquiry into the sciences. There's a lot about mathematics. A whole vision of understanding the world as it is that we live in is produced in order to support the claim that this understanding of the world as it is is what should be in charge of ourselves both individually and in society. And so all of that growing out of this one question, what is justice, the inquiry really doesn't cease until death with the vision of the afterlife and the myth of her at the end of the book. It's such a rich book that I mm. think we can't go any further in pursuing individual strands within it. I think one must just hope that some of the people listening to the discussion will be prompted by it to go off and, and have a look at it for themselves. I think we must move on now to the later dialogues of Plato. And when we do, when the move from the middle to the late period of Plato's output shows us another change of character again, uh, suddenly the dialogues become less literary, dramatic, colourful, etc., and rather more what we might call academic or analytic. Why is that? In my view, they're not actually less dramatic. What happens is that all the effort of irony and imagery that in previous works went into depicting the people undertaking the discussion, that's all now going to the ideas and arguments themselves. 
And very often it's ideas and arguments that are familiar to us from Plato's own earlier works, like the Republic or the Phaedo. Um, Plato, I mean, one of the extraordinary things about Plato, and he may have been the first writer in history to be able to do this, is he built up a relationship with his readers such that when writing one work, he can take it for granted that his readers have read his previous works. He can surprise them, he can make allusions, he can build up resonances through that. And what he most of all does with that is conduct a sort of public self-scrutiny of his own earlier ideas, relying on us, the readers, to know what they are, but saying, so to speak, don't get too enthused by the Phaedo and the Republic. It was all very fine stuff, I know, but these truths, if they were, are no good to you or to me if we can't defend them against criticism. And maybe they weren't truths anyway. Maybe they were all wrong. So let's take a few of them and subject them to really hard analytical criticism. Now, if you had to single out one of these later dialogues for particular mention, which would you choose? Well, the prime example is the Parmenides, where the tables are turned on Socrates. Socrates puts forward the theory of forms, as he stated it in the Phaedo, and it's unmistakably the Phaedo. Um, there are various verbal connections with the Phaedo that Plato clearly expects his reader to pick up and say to himself, gosh, the Socrates of the Phaedo is now on the receiving end of the questions, and in fact, old Parmenides, who is talking to Socrates in this dialogue, produces a series of objections and criticisms of the theory of forms, which many philosophers from Aristotle onwards have thought were quite devastating. And Plato doesn't tell us the answer. He produces the criticisms, and you're left to decide for yourself whether they're fair, unfair, and if they're fair, what you're to do about the theory of forms. One of the uh, dialogues, which some people think is late, others think is one of the middle period ones, but that doesn't matter, which stands aside from <coughs> the rest, is the Timaeus, isn't it? Mm. Partly because it actually contains more cosmology and science than it does philosophy, but mostly, I think, because it also contains a wonderfully poetic creation myth, not, not, not dissimilar, actually, to the one in uh, the book of Genesis that I think we're all familiar with. Now, why did Plato do that? I mean, what I have in mind in asking the question is this. Do you think, for example, he believed it literally in the way one must assume, I suppose, that the ancient Hebrews literally believe in the book of Genesis? I myself think he did not believe it literally. The, the question was controversial in ancient times, but Plato's closest associates took the view that Plato presented a narrative of the divine craftsman imposing order on chaos, meaning this to be a vivid way of presenting an analysis of what he took to be the fundamental constituents of the whole universe. They wanted to see the entire universe as a product of order imposed on disorder, and particularly mathematical order, and that, of course, is something very different from Genesis. The divine craftsman is embodying above all, mathematical intelligence in the world at large. So it's a, it's a poetic way of explaining the intelligibility of the world, which has been a mystery for people, actually, from the earliest times until now. Right. And, of course, such a general proposition as the proposition that the whole universe is the product of imposing order on disorder isn't a proposition that you can prove, either in general or in all its vast detailed ramifications, and Plato is very well aware of this, and that's another aspect, I think, mm. for another reason why he puts it forward as a myth, but a myth which is the guiding inspiration of something that Plato was very serious about. That's a research program in which he enlisted at the academy all the leading mathematicians of his day. Um, Every advance in mathematical astronomy, mathematical harmonics, even a medical theory which shows disease and health to be a matter of the proportions between the constituent elements in the body, each such step forward is a further proof of something Plato cared deeply about, the idea that mathematical regularities and harmonies and proportions are what's, what explain things, and these mathematical harmonies and proportions are for Plato 
the prime examples of goodness and beauty. So really, this is a vision for a scientific research program which is to show that goodness and beauty are the fundamental expansionary factors in the world at large. What you're saying now makes me wonder how all this ties up with the Republic. Because when you were talking about the Republic a few minutes ago, one of the things you stressed was that that is, in a sense, a complete philosophy. Well, now, how does what Plato is saying in the Timaeus fit into that apparently already complete philosophy? Well, I think it fits it like a hand fits into a glove, in that what you have in the Republic is a sketch of a program for a scientific above all a mathematically scientific understanding of nature, which Plato begins to carry out or do his share of in the Timaeus. Uh, and indeed, it's the Timaeus which people went to as the statement of Plato's philosophy for a very long time. And it's really only a more recent development, which has taken the Republic to be the work of Plato that you go and read. For a long time, it was the Timaeus. So what you're saying is, is that all that cosmology and science in the, in the Timaeus, or you say Timaeus, mm. I say Timaeus, uh, taught in different schools, uh, all that cosmology and science is the working out in practice of possibilities that were canvassed in the Republic. Yes, and the Timaeus presents itself dramatically in its introduction as a continuation, in some sense, of the discussion in yeah. the Republic. Yeah. Um, and what's more, this research program, as I called it, that's announced in the Republic as to how astronomy should be done, how mathematical harmonics should be done, was actually done. And behind that academic research program is, I mean, that is the starting point of many of the very greatest achievements of Greek mathematical science, mm. uh, down to the astronomy of Ptolemy. Uh, Ptolemy's astronomy is the ultimate descendant of the astronomy that was done in the academy by these leading mathematicians that Plato gathered together there mm. to show us a world where mathematical order is the governing principle that's the most important must feature most importantly in your science. And since mathematical order is the expression for Plato of goodness and beauty, these sciences which show us the world as it is, objectively speaking, are simultaneously sciences of value. And that's how the metaphysical aspects of the Republic, this knowledge that the philosophers are to learn, can simultaneously be the foundation for a radical new kind of politics, because what the philosophers are learning before they come to rule the rest of us are sciences of value as well as fact. Mm. Another of the dialogues, uh, another of the later dialogues, that you yourself have a particular reputation for knowing about in the academic world is the Theaetetus. Why have you specialized in that? Because I find it endlessly exciting and I've never plumbed to the bottom. Every time I go ba back to it, there seems to be more to, to discover about it. And I think many philosophers have found uh, this is the dialogue that Leibniz translated, Berkeley wrote quite a lot about, Wittgenstein quoted. This is a dialogue which other philosophers have always found stimulating. What's it about? The question is, what is knowledge? And it's a large-scale exercise of the kind of Socratic discussion that went on in the early dialogues, but on a much bigger, grander scale. Three answers are given. Knowledge is perception. Knowledge is true judgment. Knowledge is true judgment together with an account. Each of those answers is knocked down in true Socratic style. We're not told what Plato thinks knowledge is at the end, but we have learnt such an enormous amount about the problem and about the ramifications of the problem that we go away feeling the richer rather than the poorer. There's no consensus to this day on what the precise nature of knowledge is, but I guess that the nearest we have to a generally accepted view 
is actually close to what you've just said, namely that it's perception, something that's based on direct experience, plus our capacity to provide justification for it. Ah, you've now produced an interesting solution to the problem we're left with at the end of the dialogue, namely all of those answers have been knocked down, taken separately. It's been, Socrates has refuted the thesis that knowledge is perception, refuted the thesis that knowledge is true judgment, refuted the thesis that true judgment is, uh, that knowledge is true judgment with an account, and now you're suggesting that perhaps we could get a definition of knowledge by somehow putting all the elements of the three separate definitions together into one, and thereby making a theory of knowledge um, around a definition of knowledge. That would be a highly suitable response to this kind of dialogue, namely suggesting a definition of one's own in terms of what one's learnt from the dialogue. We must, I think, bring this uh, discussion to a close now, but before we do, I would like to ask you something about the influence of all this, because Plato must be either the most influential or one of the two or three most influential philosophers there have ever been. Uh, can you say a little, if only briefly, about what the main lines of this influence have been? I think it's important to remember there were two philosophies opposed to materialism in the ancient world. There was materialism in the form of the atomic doctrine held by Democritus and Epicurus, and there were the anti-materialist, philosophers, Plato and Aristotle, both of whom are opposed to the suggestion that everything, life, order, mind, civilization, art, nature, can all be explained as the outcome of the movements of particles of matter subject just to the laws of motion and their own nature. Now, Aristotelianism is opposed to that sort of materialism, but Aristotelianism carries the war so far into the enemy camp that it's actually very hard to reconcile the Aristotelian philosophy with the modern scientific enterprise, which has a lot about atoms and the movements of particles of matter and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and indeed, I think it was no accident that when the modern scientific enterprise got going, it got going by throwing away the Aristotelianism, which had so dominated the Middle Ages. But Platonism it's much easier to um, reconcile with the modern scientific enterprise. And that's why I think, since the Renaissance, really, Platonism has lived on after the death of Aristotelianism, because that's a philosophy which you can use or be influenced by if you're seeking to show how scientific and spiritual values can be reconciled, if you want to do justice to the complexities of things where materialism is giving just too simple and simplistic a story. And there's something very contemporary to us, isn't there, about the fact that Plato's cosmology and Plato's science is based on an essentially mathematical physics. Yes. Thank you very much, Professor Bernier.